we spent a couple of lessons, a couple of days, talking about limits. And what we've tried to do is get a feel for what that means. That is, you know, we have said the words that as x approaches c, if the y values get closer and closer to l from both sides, then the limit exists and it's equal to l. And that's really our, our key understanding in all of this. The limit tells us what's happening close to an x value. It tells us what y value a function is approaching, but it tells us nothing about what actually happens at that point. So it could be that the function isn't even defined there or is defined to be something else. That doesn't matter for the limit. So then we talked about the epsilon delta, which is the formal definition of a uh, limit. And now what we're going to do is um, get some strategies. So uh, we're going to learn what do we do when we're asked to find a limit and we can't use our calculator. So how can we decide if the limit exists and if it does exist, what is it equal to? So we're going to get a few strategies here, three of them. The first is called direct substitution. And this is our go-to. So we are going to start almost always with doing this first. So for an example, we might have uh, the question is, what is the, the limit? We're asked, what is the limit as x approaches, uh, say, 2 of 1 over x plus 1? So with direct substitution, we are just going to put that number that x is approaching in place of x and see what we get. And in this case, when we do that, we get one-third. So if we get a number, then that is it. That's, it's as simple as that. That is our limit. So the limit exists and it is equal to one-third. So sometimes it doesn't go quite that smoothly. So let's talk about some examples where it's not so smooth. So the first one might be, what if we asked what's the limit as x approaches negative 1 of 1 over x plus 1? So when we try to direct substitute that in there, it becomes 1 over and negative 1 plus 1 is 0. Now it's true that this is not defined, but remember, a limit isn't saying what happens right at x equals negative 1. It's saying what happens as x gets close to negative 1. So we should be thinking anyway, as we plug in numbers coming in from the right, like say 0, negative 0.5, negative 0.9, negative 0.999, what's happening is we're getting something that's 1 divided by something very small but positive. So I'm going to say a small positive. So as you divide by a very small number, then what we get, so imagine, you know, you're dividing by, say, 1, 1, 100. Let me see if I can erase that and write that better. So if you divide by 1, 100, that's the same thing as multiplying by the reciprocal. That's going to get very large. And we can get smaller. As, uh, if x was 1 over 1,000, then this would go to 1,000. So really what's happening from the right, that is our right-hand limit, is going to positive infinity. Now once we get infinity of any style, positive or negative, we know the limit isn't going to exist. But just to clarify, as we approach from the left, if we plug in something like negative 1.1, negative 1.01, um, so our left-hand limit is going to be 1 over a very small negative, which is going to then go to a large negative when we divide by a very small one, and so our left-hand limit is going to go to negative infinity. At any rate, either one of those would let us know that the limit does not exist. And so we can shortcut that and just know that if we say the limit as x approaches 5 of 1 over x minus 5, and we plug it in and we do direct substitution, when you get 1 over 0 with direct substitution, that means the limit is not going to exist because it is going to be infinite, if we had to say y. Okay, now, the more interesting of these is going to be if we do something like 
um, say, so I'm going to call this number two. So this is our direct substitution. Now, the second one is going to be uh, what we do when direct substitution leads to zero over zero. So when we get zero over zero, that we say is uh, indeterminate. So if you try to sub direct substitute in our value of c, that limit value, uh, that and you get zero over zero, and then come through very clear. Zero over zero means we don't know. So it could be the limit doesn't exist. It could be the limit does exist. If the limit exists, we don't know what it is. We just don't know, and we have to do something clever to uh, resolve it. And one of the clever things we're going to do is to factor and cancel. So, and we'll look at another option, too, in a moment here. So if we have, for our example, we have what is the limit as x approaches 3 of x minus 3 over x squared minus 9. When we try direct substitution and you just plug in the 3, you get 0 in the numerator, and 3 squared is 9, minus 9 is 0 in the denominator. That's indeterminate. So that means we're going to have to do something clever, and the clever thing we're going to do is to factor that denominator. So when we factor the x squared minus 9 as x minus 3x plus 3, that allows us to cancel the x minus 3s and simplify that into x plus 3. So you may be thinking correctly, oh, when we did this in AP Prep, when these canceled, that meant that we were going to have a hole in the graph at x equals 3. And that's exactly what's happening. And we don't have to get that detailed because, uh, uh, because we're not trying to actually graph it. But remember, if there's a hole in the graph, the limit could still exist. So once we have canceled, now we use direct substitution again. And now when we plug in the 3, it's no longer indeterminate. In fact, we know it's going to be 1 sixth, and that is, in fact, our limit. Now, a second thing that can happen when we get 0 over 0 is we're going to look at something that's got radicals in it. And so what we're going to do is rationalize. So here's our example. We're going to say, what is the limit as x goes to 0 of, say, the square root of x plus, now let's go, let's put on top. Let's go just x on top. And in the denominator, we'll say the square root of x plus 9 minus 3. So if we try again our direct substitution, and we just plug in 0, that makes the numerator 0. And on the bottom, we get the square root of 9, which is 3 minus 3, is also 0, which is, again, going to be indeterminate. So that means we're going to have to do something clever. Now, the clever thing we're going to do here, I can't really factor that, but what we're going to do is to multiply top and bottom by the conjugate of wherever we see that radical. So that is, we're going to multiply top and bottom by what will make this thing with the radical in it the difference of two squares. So we're going to multiply top and bottom by the square root of x plus 9 plus 3. So in the numerator, I'm not going to multiply that out or distribute because I have a hunch that something good is going to happen here shortly. So I'm going to leave that as it is. Now in the denominator, when we multiply that out, we're going to get the x plus 9. That's because when we multiply those radicals, the radicals will drop out. And then we're going to get the 3 times the radical and the negative 3 times the radical will cancel. And then that minus 3 times 3 is going to be a minus 9. And so we're going to get the 9 and the minus 9 to cancel. And that will leave us, once those are out of the picture, 
we can then uh, cancel the x's, and that will leave us with just the square root of x plus 9 plus 3. Now we're free to use our direct substitution and plug in the 0 for x, and so we'll get to the square root of 9 plus 3, which is 3 plus 3, which is 6. And that's going to be our limit. Now, the third thing that can happen, too, is something that we don't really have a clever, um, a clever strategy so much. But what we can do is just test numbers that are very close to the limit. Test numbers, I'm going to say close to x equals c. So an example here might be something that we've kind of seen. I don't know if you can recognize it in its translated form. The limit as x approaches 4 of, say, x minus 4 over the absolute value of x minus 4. So here, if you imagine that you're going to plug in numbers very close to 4 from the right and left. So if we plug in, say, x is like 4.1, that's going to give us 4.1 minus 4 is going to be 0.1. The absolute value of 0.1 is also 0.1. That will give us a positive 1. On the left side, if we plug in, say, at 3.9, we're going to get to 3.9 minus 4 is a negative 0.1, and we're going to get a positive 0.1 on the denominator. And you may recognize this is that one where the graph is going to look something like that. So it's going to uh, have a different right-hand limit than left-hand limit, and therefore the limit does not exist. So the strategy we used is to plug a value uh, close to C on either side. Okay, so I'm going to move to a new panel. And now we're going to talk about limits as x approaches positive or negative infinity. So as x approaches plus or minus infinity. So here, for example, if we take the limit as x approaches infinity of, we'll say, 2x plus 7 all over, say, 4 minus x. So the key idea here is as x gets really, really big, in the numerator, 2 times a very large number is getting huge. So if you imagine x is like a 1,000, a million, a billion, this plus 7 compared to the 2x is relatively insignificant. That is, it's almost like it doesn't exist. The numerator is going to act like 2x. Same thing for the denominator. As x gets really, really big, 100, 1,000, a million, a billion, this little old 4 is going to be pretty insignificant. So we're going to see the denominator is going to act like negative x. And then once we can say that that's true, then we can see that 2x over negative x is going to be negative 2, and that is the limit. So to um, shorten things up, our strategy is going to be to look at the terms in the numerator and denominator that have the highest power of x and to take them and their coefficients and see what that is equal to. Now in this case, we saw that the, the degree of the numerator and denominator were the same. So let's look at what happens when the degree in the numerator and denominator is not the same. So for example, if we have something like uh, what is the limit as x goes to infinity of x squared uh, plus 7. And in the denominator, we have something like 5x minus 4. So again, what we're going to do is the same idea we did above. We're going to just look at the highest powers of x and their coefficients in the numerator and denominator. So this is going to act like x squared over 5x. And you can, if you want, cancel those x's, which means this in turn is going to act like x over 5. Now, as x grows large without bound, imagine x is going to be a 1,000, a million, a billion. 
this is growing large without bound, we could say correctly that the limit is going to be infinity, or perhaps even better and safer would be that the limit does not exist. That's because the degree of the numerator was greater than the degree in the denominator. So let's look at one the other way, where the degree is larger in the denominator. So let's look at, say, the limit as x goes to infinity of 3x plus 7 all over, say, a 4 minus x squared. So again, as x goes to infinity, we're going to look at the highest powers of x and their coefficients. The other terms are going to be relatively insignificant. So this is going to act like 3x over negative x squared. And if it helps to clarify, we can cancel one of those x's and imagine it's going to act like 3 over negative x. Now as x gets very, very large in the positive direction, put in a thousand, a million, a billion, then that 3 is stuck being a little old 3, the denominator is getting huge, that will approach 0, and that is going to be our limit. Now, some challenging limits. Let's look at something a little uh, more complicated. So let's first take the limit as x goes to infinity of, say, the square root of x squared plus 7 all over x. Now, here's the reasoning behind this. As x gets bigger and bigger and bigger, again, inside that radical, this 7 is pretty insignificant. So this is going to act like the square root of x squared over x as x goes to infinity. Now here's where you have to be very careful. The square root of x squared is not just x. The square root of x squared is the absolute value of x. Because remember, this symbol square root, which is known as the principal square root, um, it is the non-negative square root. So a number like, say, uh, if we use this for, say, 25, there are, in fact, two square roots of any positive number. But this symbol means choose the one that is not negative. Okay, so the square root of x squared could not be a negative number. To guarantee that, no matter what our choice of x is, we're going to use that absolute value. Now, in this particular case, it doesn't really matter, because as x goes to positive infinity, we're plugging in positive 1,000 over 1,000, positive a million over a million, and so on, and that's still going to be just 1. But if we take, say, the limit as x approaches negative infinity, and we look at this, say, square root of x squared plus 7 over x. Now, when we uh, imagine that the x is getting huge and that 7 is insignificant, now we, it is going to be important that we recognize this is absolute value over x. So now if you plug in, say, negative 1,000 or negative a million, then this is going to approach negative 1. So here's an example of a function that has a different limit to the right than it does to the left. Okay, let's do uh, an example of a piecewise function. So let's, um, let's say this is going to be piecewise functions. So we'll consider f of x to be the absolute value of, let's say, uh, uh, x plus 1 uh, when x is less than 3, and we will say uh, 4x minus 3 when x is greater than or equal to 3. Now, the limit as we approach anything other than 3 is not really very challenging because this part is Going to be, the limit's going to exist anywhere for x less than 3. You would just direct substitute in that number. Likewise for the bottom part. The interesting part is what is the limit as x approaches 3 of that function. 
So now what we're going to get is that that left-hand limit, that is the limit as x approaches 3 from the left of this function f of x. Well, if we're plugging in values that are less than 3, we're coming in from this side. And so that means what we're going to get is just direct substitute in 3 plus 1. That left-hand limit is going to be 4. The right-hand limit, which is that uh, limit, as if you want to write it formally, as we approach 3 from the right, that's going to put us in this branch. So now when we plug in that 3, we're going to get 4 times 3 minus 3. That's 12 minus 3, which is 9. So since the left-hand limit is not equal to the right-hand limit, our conclusion is that the limit does not exist. Does that make sense? Let's look at another example. So I'm going to say g of x is equal to, we'll say g of x is equal to uh, 4x uh, minus 3 for x less than 1. And we will say it's going to be x squared for x greater than or equal to 1. And, of course, what we're interested in is what is the limit as x approaches 1 of, I guess we called our function g of x. So, once again, we're going to say the left-hand limit is going to be, we're going to plug into this branch. So that's going to be 4 times 1 minus 3 is 4 minus 3 is 1. The right-hand limit is going to be 1 squared, which is 1. Since the left-hand limit is equal to the right-hand limit, we say that that limit as x approaches 1 of g of x is equal to 1. And a third kind of, final kind of problem is, can we find k uh, so that the limit as x approaches 2 uh, of f of x is equal to f of 2, and I'm going to give you a piecewise function here. So we're going to have our f of x is going to be uh, x squared plus 3 for x not equal to 2, and we're going to have that it's going to be a uh, 3k plus 1 for x equals 2. Uh, hold on. Let's do that differently, because that's not very interesting, so I'm going to make that be for x less than 2, and let's make this for x greater than or equal to 2. So what we want is for the left-hand limit to equal the right-hand limit. So I'm going to say we need, for this limit to exist, the left-hand limit to equal the right-hand limit. So our left-hand limit is going to be this branch right here. So if we plug in 2, we're going to get 2 squared plus 3 is going to be 4 plus 3 is 7. So for this limit to exist, we need the right-hand limit to equal 7. And our right-hand limit is, oh man, I made that too easy, but we're going to get, uh, we need for that, and there's nowhere to plug in 2 because there is no x value here. So uh, we want the 3k plus 1 to equal 7. This wasn't a great choice. So what we need is for the k to equal 2, which is not a great choice because that's the same number there. But for the right-hand limit to equal the left-hand limit, we need for k to be 2. All right, hopefully you can do homework number 12.